Stephanie Dawson and welcome to My Classic Soul, the podcast dedicated to the best soul and R&B music throughout the decades. In our latest episode, SoulMusic.com founder David Nathan is joined by longtime SoulMusic.com colleague and music industry veteran Michael Lewis. Michael has worked with a number of major record labels including The Face, Motown and Sony Music. Today, they're talking about musical pioneers who recorded and performed songs that provided empowerment and inspiration from the 60s and 70s. We're talking Marvin Gaye, Nina Simone, Curtis Mayfield, uh, Stevie Wonder, amongst many others. So, without further ado, let's join David and Michael as they discuss the importance soul music has played in uplifting generations in the quest for freedom, justice and civil rights for all. Mike, I think that um, you know, for uh, this edition of uh, My Classic Soul, it would be really good to talk about some of the uh, songs and the music that has helped inform um, the rich history of, I was going to call it protest music, but it really isn't. It's, it's, it's you know, commentary on the times. Mm-hmm. And uh, I also particularly wanted to talk about the, um, how music has made such a difference in empowering people, inspiring people, and, um, you know, really helped, uh, I would say, the cause in terms of the cause of freedom, you know, civil rights, the importance of um, of, of justice. And, and so there, are, I was doing some research on some of those anthems, some of which I grew up with, and some of which you might be aware of, but might have come a little bit before your time. Um, so why don't we start with um, talking about your first memories of music that you considered to be uh, empowering, that was really get, uh, giving a message, a message that really impacted your your life, so to speak. Probably, it would probably be what's going on, because I was, I guess, um, about 12 when that, when that came out. Yes. So that's the first time I really remember hearing music and uh, a, a, a attaching to that, the feeling of it and the, the meaning of it. Mm-hmm. You know, I think everything was before that, I heard it, but it didn't really, didn't really click in. What's going on is the first time that I really paid attention to the lyrics and what Marvin Gaye was singing about. Did you know what the the songs were about? I mean, I mean, at twelve years old, I'm assuming you were aware of what was what was going on. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think I, I think I had a, a good sense of um, on some level. I, I don't know the depths of it. I can't really recreate what my th- thinking process was back then, but I'm sure that it that it ha- had an effect on me. I mean, I distinctly remember my uncle coming over with that album. And it was kind of, it was, it was an event where the family, we all got together and, uh, and, and listened to it. I, I, I definitely distinctly remember that. Yeah. It's interesting. I, I, I often hear people talk about Marv, that album, Marvin Gaye's what's going on is like the, the album that woke people up mm-hmm. and in, in many ways. And why I find that interesting? Cause there's a whole group of artists and music, prior to Marvin Gaye Mm -hmm. that uh, sometimes gets uh, maybe not forgotten, but not given the same kind of um, credit for the difference it made. Um, And and I want to refer to some of those, um, some of those artists and some of that music, some of which I'm I'm sure you may have become familiar with retrospectively, maybe not at the time, given your age, but you and I have a slight age difference. A little bit, about 10 years. About ten, 10 years, yeah. But those 10 years, there's a whole lot happening in those 10 yeah, years, and, and especially, you know, in the 10 years as we're relating to this particular subject, um, you know, starting in like 63, 64. Um, it's interesting when I was doing a little research um, into, you know, which artists, uh, and recording artists were most um, um, vocal, in terms of being willing to talk about what was happening at the time uh, in the civil rights movement in particular. 
And um, there's, there was once one, uh, I guess you could say an anomaly, because people never, I don't think this is a record most people even knew about. Uh, Lena Horne, who, of course, is, is always thought of as a, primarily as an actress and a singer, mm-hmm. uh, but certainly as an actress in that time period, recorded a song called Now. It's very obscure, and of course, you can count on me to come up with obscurities. <laughs> yeah, I've never heard of that. Yeah, well, most people haven't. And it was really about um, now, like now is a time, you know, time to, you know, time for people to rise up and, and you know, n- not put up with the stuff that's going on. It's, it's, it's really, a, it's a very, it's a very, um, uh, what would you call it, uh, ahead of its time, uh, civil rights, an- it wasn't an anthem, but, a, 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 you know, it was a, a specifically about that. And particularly because Lena Horne, I suppose, wasn't necessarily, associated with, um, uh, maybe, maybe she was from a political standpoint, but I don't know that she was thought of as a recording artist who was known for, um, for creating anthems that really uh, were about the, the times, about the, 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 you know, what was happening at the time. Now, so what, year, you know, what year was that? That was 1963. Oh, okay. We could check. It might have been 64, but I think it's 63. And I only knew about it through someone else. I didn't know of it at the time because I was also, um, you know, in my in my early teens at that point. But what, what, what's interesting is, you know, again, if we think about some of the heroes and heroines of music at that time, you know, obviously one of the first ones that comes to mind is Nina Simone. Mm-hmm. Uh, Nina Simone. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, and I'm curious because she played a, a big role, I think, um, in being a very um, outspoken mm-hmm. and and and, and uh, unrelenting voice at that time for um, justice and freedom and civil rights. She did not back down. Right. Uh, so I'm curious um, if you recall what was your first exposure to. If 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 any to her music of that time period, I'm thinking about things like um, Four Women and and mm-hmm. and then you know Mississippi Goddamn and mm-hmm. you know of course later Young Gifted and Black. But uh, were any of those uh, um, was any of that material something you heard in your home or on the radio? It, I, I I encountered Nina Simone on my in my on my own later later in life. I, I didn't hear that music growing up. Um, of course, I knew Young Gifted and Black from Aretha's version. I heard that. Um, uh, but I wasn't really familiar, so familiar with her music as, as a kid. Mm. And in your household, I'm curious, did, did, did you hear, did you hear uh, other anthems like uh, James Brown, Say It Loud, I'm Black and I'm Proud? Yeah, we had those 45s. We, I think we had every James Brown 45 that came out. <laughs> yeah. Well, 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 that one in particular was a very... Um, I mean, I think that was that was you know there was no there's no ambiguity about that. None at all. Yeah. And I'm curious, you know, uh, how, how how did your peers and the you know, people going to school with, as well as your family, how, when when that, how, how did people feel about that record? Um, if you can recall, yeah. I don't I don't recall much about it because I was I, I I'm I just remember the the the. Um, I don't want to say the uh, the it was not party, but the um, it was like a celebration, the celebration aspect of it more so than than anything else. You know, it was like a big uh, everybody groove to it. You know, that's what I really remember at that because I was even younger when when that right. was. You know? right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I thought, I, the reason I'm bringing it up is because I just want to make sure because I know that for for a lot of people. You know, they think of Marvin Gaye and they don't, which is fine. I mm-hmm. find that I think that album was, a, you know, obviously a milestone in terms of its sales and its impact worldwide. But I also think that it's important to give um, honor to the people who, before Marvin Gaye, were willing to stand up and speak right. um, through music and, 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 and sometimes face criticism. I mean, right. um, even at the risk of their career. Absolutely. Know. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, yeah, and for sure, you know, um, uh, you know, we, we talked about Nina, you know, who who was not um, 
who is not mainstream. You know, I mean, I think there's, a, again, a, sometimes mythology happens after the fact. Mm -hmm. But Nina Simone was not in the kind of um, same uh, sales same sales league, one could say, of even Aretha or, 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 or uh, you know, um, I think, or James Brown. I mean, she just wasn't yeah. thought and of he, in the same way. Yeah. As, as I think back, I don't recall seeing uh, Nina Simone on the, um, you know, the, the, the talk shows and, you know, the Ed Sullivan show and stuff like that. She wasn't, she wasn't coming into the homes the way the Supremes were or the, some of the other uh, Motown artists or popular artists at the time, you know, she was, she was not mainstream, like you said. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then there's one other, uh, in particular, um, songwriter as well as a recording artist, uh, who I think is very important to mention in, in this context, which is Curtis Mayfield. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Do you have any recall of, of of any of the impressions records like "We're a Winner" or "Keep on Pushing"? Keep on pushing. Keep on pushing. And that was, you know, that's one that I remember hearing a lot. You know, that family gathering and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, you know what's really great? Um, you know, I'm smiling because I think that those those records that the you know the Curtis Mayfield was very much a um, a pioneer. I mean, I think about the body of his work. I mean, it does cover, of course, a lot of wonderful love songs, but he really used the platform of being successful with the impressions, you know, with uh, with records like um, Gypsy Woman and It's All Right. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure I'm missing loads of major amen. Mm -hmm. and of course, people get ready. I mean, there's so many Curtis Mayfield records uh, with the impressions that set, set up... Um, set him up to become, a, you know, a voice um, in 1970, before, before when he launched his solo career. Um, and when I look back at that first uh, Curtis Mayfield uh, solo album, I mean, it's massive. I mean, mm -hmm. at the time, he move on up. Just that alone. I mean, that's a real, that's really clear in, in its message. You know, it's, it's really talking about, you know, time for, for a whole for a whole community of people, a whole culture to move up, to move on, you know, enough, enough with the, I'm, I'm trying to monitor my language. <laughs> going, going along with the program. Enough. Exactly, exactly. And, and, and because he already had the success with the impressions, he was able to do that. So when we contrast with Nina, for example, who Nina didn't have that kind of um, body of work as a, as a hit maker, Mm -hmm. So made it a little bit more difficult for her to be as accessible, one could say. Uh, and of course, James Brown, that was another person, you know, an artist who had already built up a huge following and then was much more uh, vocal in, in being a stand for um, for what needed to be said. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was his uh, that was his main uh, his main thing. You know, that was his yeah. main focus. Was, well, uh, well, let's, talk, let's talk about what happened. I'm sorry. I was saying uplifting his people. You know, that yeah. was his main focus. So let's talk some more about uh, after Marvin Gaye. So we talk about what's going on as being a milestone album. Um, when you think of what came after that, who or what uh, do you think continues the the dialogue of um, of not just it wasn't at that point just about civil rights it was more about po political about you know we're talking about the the background of the vietnam war and we're talking about you know um so much that was going well, what was going on not just in america but in the world mm -hmm. so uh, you know who who strikes you as the next uh, artist that really uh um, use music as a platform in that way stevie stevie okay. wonder Stevie Wonder um, uh, always came through with something that uh, uh, made you stop and think a little bit more than typical type of love songs, at which he did great. But uh, I'm, I'm thinking what comes to mind right away, which I always think about is You Haven't Done Nothing. Really? Uh, yeah, because, I mean, he wrote that in 1974, I think, um, uh, for Richard Nixon, 
based on the situation that we were dealing with at that, at that time. And if you look at those lyrics now, it's so parallel to what's going on in this country right now. Well, I, I, I want to just say not just in, I, I know that you refer, I know he was referring to Richard Nixon and I know to whom you're referring now, mm-hmm. but I think it's also re- relatable in other parts of the world. Trust me. Mm-hmm. I'm, yeah, of course, I'm speaking to you from London and, uh, you know, it, it, the issues that he was referring to and, 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 you know, the whole, well, we won't go over the lyrics, but, uh, but of course, I know exactly what you mean. Mm-hmm. And, and, and that's still uh, relevant in other countries today and all that we're dealing with. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Ha- you haven't done anything. It's interesting. I made a note of some other Stevie Wonder songs. That was one of them. Uh-huh. Um, and then he's Mr. Know-It-All. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh-huh. Now that one, I'm not sure if that if that was, was that was that also a Richard Nixon related, which is about is just about polit- politicians. Um, I think that was about politicians in general, but um, you know, if the shoe fits. <laughs> <laughs> well, it certainly fits these days. Uh, uh. <laughs> and, um, Let's pause here for a quick break. Then we'll return to David Nathan and Michael Lewis as they continue to discuss the groundbreaking music of artists such as Marvin, Nina, Curtis and Stevie, as well as some of the musical messengers in these current challenging times. Check out In the Meantime by renowned trumpeter Willie Bradley featuring Gerald Alston, the lead singer of the legendary group The Manhattans. This jazzy groove with lyrics right on time with what's happening in the world today is on Soul Music Records, available now on all digital platforms. You know, I was thinking, you know, it's interesting that, you know, Stevie, always, I mean, you know, when you think about the risks in some ways that artists took, mm-hmm. um, I think you mentioned that earlier when you're talking about, you know, you, to, to step out um, you know, and, and be a, a be a voice, um, not just singing love songs. There's nothing wrong with love songs, but, mm-hmm. you know, we literally got hundreds and hundreds, thousands of love songs. Mm-hmm. Not everybody was willing to speak up right. or speak out mm-hmm. um and um i was thinking it's, it, it, when, when i said that i was thinking about a couple of people who are not usually associated with um uh you could say the the, the same kind of movement of, of using music as a way to um empower inspire and to talk about conditions that they they either personally had encountered or that were societally societally happening at the time um so a couple so aretha you mentioned aretha and a young gifted and black which by the way was a big deal for aretha franklin to at that point in her in her career to you know the cover of the album is very afrocentric yes and you know for her to um use that as the title track of an album that was really you know that that was that was a definitely sending a message uh, yeah, it was. Do you remember when that album came out? What, I mean, what was your reaction to it? Were you already an Aretha fan? I was. I don't really remember that record specifically when it came out. Okay. I just remember it was something that I heard a lot, you know. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. uh, around the around the house or the mm-hmm. gatherings and things like that. Well, retrospectively, it was interesting to think that the song "Think." See, most people, which was 1968, uh, most people think that Think is a love song. Mm-hmm. But it isn't necessarily a love song. Mm-hmm. You could say it's between two people. You better think about what you're trying to do to me. But if you, but the, the, the inclusion of that, almost like a battle cry, freedom, oh, yeah. to give you my freedom, kind of lets you know that this isn't just about that. Right. That's and... Nice. Um, yeah, so it's funny because in interviews that are, that are conversations I would have with Aretha at different times, and, and, and interviews she do with other people, she would never say, "Yeah, that was written as a political statement." 
but she also wouldn't deny that mm. it was a, 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 an anthem for freedom. That's true. So let's let's hear from you about some of the the, the, the uh, other oh. uh, songs and, and and other pieces of music that you think have helped shape uh, people's thinking. Mm -hmm. um, I think about Earth, Wind, and Fire a lot too. I mean, uh, the some of the songs that uh, that Maurice White wrote um, and produced um, really talked about the the times and. And uh, was really a source of uplift for people as well, you know. Um, things sounds like Mighty Mighty. Um, uh, that's the way of the world. Um, all about love. Just just some some of those songs that really pulled in um, the, the set the stage of the time, you know, and tried to bring people up from from uh, from that. Um, I also thought about the Isley Brothers fight the power. Wow, I forgot about I forgot yeah. about the Isley Brothers. That's interesting. And when that came out. Um, yeah, yeah, I completely, I mean, no disrespect to, to the Isley Brothers. I, I com that, yeah, Harvest for the World, or just for, uh, Isley, Jasper Isley. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, How did I forget fight the power? No, I don't know. And, uh, Gil Scott Heron, the revolution will not be televised. Yeah. But uh, we see that it is. It's happening right now, you know. Um, That's deep. That, 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 y yes. And I thought about the, the, the LaBelle version where they um, met, did a, the medley with There's Something in the Air mm -hmm. on, the, on the Pressure Cooking album. I, I was thinking about that recently. Um, yeah. That's, a, yeah, I mean, that's yeah. a very powerful message for what's happening right now. Yeah, the ref revolution is definitely being televised. I was about I was about to go into a hallelujah shout. <laughs> 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 hallelujah. <laughs> well, I might as well. But that, you know, there's another there's another uh, Gil Scott Heron uh, track that for me has has really really cut deep mm. at the state of um, of life in America in particular. Uh, which, of course, I'm referring to Winter in America. America. The actual song, the actual piece is is chilling. When you listen to it, it's like, whoa. I mean, was he was he like um, was he being um, what's the right word for that? Prescient. Prescient. And also, uh, uh, was he did, was he? Yes. Was it like a premonition? Mm -hmm. Was it almost like he was speaking into the future? I mean, I know he was speaking co contemporaneously at that time. Nineteen, I think it's nineteen seventy-six. I'm not sure of the year, but I, I, I think it's it's part of what we're what we're looking at right now. That with all these songs um, that were fifty, sixty years ago, and we're still waging these battles. Mm. You know, that's the that's the, the, the scary part. Do you think that? Um, Music has played a a role in shaping people's thinking. I think absolutely, absolutely. Music is such a big part of people's lives, um, and um, when you have your your favorite artists who can um, encapsulate what's going on and help you understand it, or uh, help you process it, or give you some sense of uh, hope or resolution, uh, I think it's very important. And I, I think we've all benefited from that. I know I have, certainly. I'm, I'm, I'm somebody who's, I've always been really lyrics oriented. I've always listened to the lyrics. I've always listened to the words. Some people just hum along and they don't really even necessarily pay attention to everything that's going on. But I've always, from a very young age, I've always really paid attention to and listened to lyrics that people are singing and I've, I've been, I've been affected by that, you know, mm. um, there's another song I wanted to, uh, mention. Um, there was, uh, Diana Ross recorded Brown baby, which was an Oscar Brown jr. Song. I didn't, I didn't know Oscar Brown jr. Before that, uh, of course I went back and found out more about him after listening to him. She did a medley of uh, uh, Brown baby and, um, save the children. Um, I think Nina Nina recorded Brown Baby also. 
She did. She yeah. did. Yeah. yeah. So that's one of the songs that I, I've been thinking about leading up to this um, this conversation. Uh, yeah. also. And that was in the 73 or 73. 73, 1973, yeah. yeah. And Nina's was 1962. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because his his album with that came in 1960 or 61. I don't remember. I have to look back at that. Yeah, yeah he's, he's one of the unsung poets of that right. time period. Um, uh, I remember buying an album by Oscar Brown Jr. called Sin and Soul. That's the that's the album that I was on. Yeah. yeah. Well, of course, I was I, I was I was a teenager. I think probably the I was more I was more drawn to the sin part. <laughs> <laughs> the one thing I wanted to say about the what you said about music, I want to also say that you know we're talking about soul music in particular. I mean, mm -hmm. yes, there are other um, you know forms of, of of music that have definitely impacted people's thinking. You know, we can't forget that, you know, at the time, the 60s in particular, people like Bob Dylan and Joan Baez and Peter, Paul and Mary, you know, these, you know, the, the, the Pete Seeger, they were all part of the folk movement, so to speak, and initially Bob Dylan. Anyway. Um, and, um, you know, they were also, you know, standing up for, for you know, justice and freedom and, 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 you know, change, really change. You know, they knew that change was, well, it's kind of like, an obvious thing to say, blowing in the wind, mm -hmm. and it was. And um, so they also helped, I think, in many ways, set up a particular dynamic that it was okay to put the, put these uh, to, to to put feelings about what needed to happen on record. Because if you go back before that, there's not a lot of what one would call, and I'm putting the word in quote, protest songs. Mm -hmm. That's true. So just, yeah, it's interesting. I, I was also thinking about somebody else who, who never gets mentioned in this context because she's not a songwriter. But one of the people who was uh, who, who, if you if you check um, her catalog, uh, often recorded songs that had a social message. Uh, has been Dionne Warwick. You know what the world needs now, now is love. She also recorded Windows of the World, which is a song written by. Um, obviously back rack and David about um, soldiers returning from from Vietnam um, so she's much more of a I, I don't necessarily think people think of Dion as a as a um, as an activist in music and if you check her catalog you'll find it's dotted with all kinds of things particularly from the 60s all the way through to 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 now I mean you know um, and, and, and it's interesting because I again I don't think she's thought of in in those terms uh, and just because she didn't write the songs doesn't mean she didn't find songs to interpret. Mm -hmm. You know, what the world needs now is love. When this is the word that I just mentioned, uh, she also did record Young, Gifted, and Black at some point. I didn't and, know. Yeah, and a song called Stand, which was of course Sly and the Family Stone. Um, so there are a lot of people who, a lot of artists who, who you mentioned Diana Ross, who again would not be someone necessarily right. people would associate with, you know, being uh, using music as a platform. But that particular song you mentioned, Brown Baby and, and Save the Children, I mean, yeah, I mean, I think there are a lot, a lot more um, heroes and, and sheroes in, right. music, in soul music that, that, that don't necessarily get, um, get the kind of credit for, 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 what the, for speaking out through music. So let's move it on to, uh, to, to the 80s and 90s, because um, I was having a bit of a hard time finding... Um, artists in, in the soul music world who continue to um, to kind of rally other, unless we went to rap and hip hop. Yeah. I couldn't find that many R&B mainstream artists who were really advocates for the same kind of um, you know, m m message in the music other than in the late 70s, Gamble and Huff through their artists like the OJs. You know, I was thinking about all those OJs records, which are very clearly you know, social messages. Oh, right, right. And, Message in the music. And, uh, absolutely. Uh, wake up everybody, of course. Uh, and for the love of money. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. How could we forget that, right? Right? And just really, I mean, real messengers. I mean, real messengers. And, and, but then I go to the 80s, and I, I'm kind of a little bit like, well, who, who, who was carrying the torch? 
I think I think we uh, got complacent probably in a lot of ways for for a period. But um, you know, there's there's been some some movement. Um, I'm, I'm thinking about there was a song on uh, Erica Badu's um, Mama's Gun album. Actually, she wrote with uh, Betty Wright called mm. AD 2000, uh, which was uh, referencing uh, Amadou Diallo. So, yes. the, you know, the, the, there is some, some, some activity. Um, it's not as, uh, as prevalent maybe as in the, in the 70s, uh, uh, 60s and 70s. Um, and, th- and recently, you know, there's the, the song Glory that John mm-hmm. and Common did for the, for the movie Selma. Um, uh, you know, it was, it was uh, related to, to that movie and the events of uh, of uh, of uh, the '60s, but um, once again, the song is so powerful and relevant to today. Mm. You know, if, if if you look at the current landscape, I mean, obviously, we know a lot of people are not recording at this immediate moment. Well, some people are; they're just doing it at home. They're not necessarily doing it in the formal sense in a recording studio, although many people do have recording studios in their home, so having said that, mm. do you think that what's happening in, in, in America and in the world right now, that we're going to see a kind of upsurge of, 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 of music that's really going to speak to oh, I think the that, conditions I think that we're all dealing with? I think absolutely it will, because uh, for one thing, I think so many things are happening now also because people are have had to stop. You know, people necessarily have had to stop, and uh, and that gives a, an opening for some uh, reflection, and hopefully there will be some uh, astounding creativity coming out of coming out of this. I'm sure. I'm sure it will. Uh, there's, there's too much happening right now for it not to be affecting artists and having it come through what they do. You know, um, and that's. Uh, Something that you know, Nina was very, very uh, <laughs> insistent on an artist's yeah. responsibility to uh, reflect the times. You know, yeah, no kidding, man, no kidding. You just, you just really, just by virtue of you saying that, it really, it, 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 I kind of felt very proud of of my having had the good fortune to be around her. Mm-hmm. Uh, in, 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 you know, starting in 1965, uh, when it was not um, fashionable to to take a stand in music. And, and she, but she was unrelenting in that. She felt that while, yes, she was there to entertain and create great love songs and create songs that would endure, um, she also felt an obligation to use her artistry to um, to speak up and speak out. Just to remind me of one thing, I just want to share something with you and with everyone on the podcast is it really reminds, take, takes me into what you're talking about, like what you just said about the responsibility of artists. Um, I mean, it's not for everyone to do, but clearly some people feel the, the call to use the platform. So I have to try to picture this, Michael. And everyone listening to the podcast. So it's 1965, and I'm still in school. And uh, some of my classmates and my teachers were aware of my growing interest in music, and in particular, what we would then have called R&B. And um, so I remember my assistant, the assistant head teacher of school, Mr. Carey, said, oh, "You know, I'd like you to bring in and, and play for the class." a piece of music from the music that you're currently listening to. Because I guess I had a bit of a reputation of being this kind of, you know, I don't know, I don't even know how it exactly came about. He said, you know, we just kind of like to know who, you know, we know you started this fan club for Nina Simone. I remember that part. And who is she? Because most people don't know she was. So I brought in an album called Pastel Blues. Mm-hmm. Um, and I chose in the library of the school was my classmates from my my class to play Strange Fruit by Billie Holiday. Now, that was Nina's interpretation, which is very chilling and very stark. And I told 
my pu my fellow pupils what it was about. I gave them some idea of who she was, and that this was about、uh, people being lynched for the color of their skin. And I played it. What grade was that? Do you remember? I would, well, it was 1965, so I was 17. We don't necessarily say、okay. grades in England, so I don't know. <laughs> we, I was in the whatever form, sixth form, or whatever. I can't remember what we called it back then. But I was 17, so all my fellow students were 17, or in that age group. And、um, huh. I put the put it put the needle on, and just you know, everyone sat and listened. And when it was over, it was. That it was complete silence, and then every and then all my fellow students started applauding. Wow! And that's a that's a memory that 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 you know has certain things that see it in your memory banks forever. And I had the、uh, I corresponded with one of my、uh, schoolmates、uh, from that class through Facebook. And he said, "Well, I always wonder what happened to you. You know, what happened to you?" And I, I, he said, "I said, well, do you remember?" He said, "The only, the only thing I can remember about you is you played, you played that Nina Simone track to it for us." Wow, you made an effect. You had an effect on people. That that, that was song. That song would do it. Yeah, that's true. Well, <laughs> we've now gone down memory lane. We've talked about what maybe. What we can expect from today's artists、mm-hmm. uh, in terms of keeping the messages going. So I'm going to I'm going to I'd like to complete our conversation, Michael, with asking you just if there was one artist today who you think is the one that could really use music and the platform of music to use to deliver a potent message about what people are dealing with, all the things they're dealing with. Who would it be? And we want to talk about a soul music, a soul music related artist.、Uh, uh, yeah, who 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 would you nominate? Rafael Sadiq. Okay. Because、Why? he kind of already has his latest record, Jimmy Lee,、um, which actually is written in uh, 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 for his his brother, an older brother, a sibling who um, had um, drug and、um, incarceration. Issues and passed away, I think, from AIDS.、Um, and a lot of that music,、uh, it came out around the end of last year, and I've been listening to it more and more lately. It's very powerful, very powerful songs.、Uh, wow. Well, and, I'm definitely going to check that out.、Yeah. I, I was not aware of it, really. And I, I think. Well, he's, he's he's just one of my favorite artists right now. Anyway. Well, Michael, thanks again for you know、uh, for this conversation. I think it's really、um, it's really appropriate for all that we're dealing with in in, in the world, and you know, and I, I, I I'm I'm、uh, encouraged that soul music continues to be a genre that、uh, really influences and impacts people、mm-hmm. all over the world with messages that are actually universal. Yeah. And hopefully, somebody who may be listening to this who is not familiar with some of these songs will、uh, check them out.、Because、Absolutely, they definitely、uh, deserve listen, repeated listening, and、uh, yeah. you know, it's the, it's time. Yeah, it's time. All right, thanks, All right. Michael. I'll talk to you soon, man. Absolutely. All right. Bye-bye. Bye bye. David and Michael. And that's all we've got time for today. But please don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review on your favourite podcast platform. And visit us for breaking news and daily updates about your favourite soul and R&B artists over at SoulMusic.com. I'm Bethany Dawson. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time on My Classic Soul.